Hey everyone, how's it going? I'm a total dork and today we're ranking every Call of Duty Zombies game from worst to best. With Vanguard Zombies coming to an end earlier this year and with no upcoming Zombies content on the horizon, it seemed like a very good time to take stock on what has worked for the game and what hasn't. Plus, I just played through all of the non triarch made modes for the first time this year, so it's the most complete version of this ranking that I've ever done. There are 10 Call of Duty Zombies modes out there, and at the number 10 spot we have what I already know is going to be a controversial take. When Call of Duty Vanguard released and we all played Durong Fong for the first time, it was nearly unanimous that it was the worst iteration of the game by far. And when I played Durong Fong last November, I also thought that it was the worst version of the mode and the easy choice for the bottom spot on this list. That was until June 16th when I played Advanced Warfare's Exo Zombies mode for the very first time. That's right, as it stands right now, I think Exo Zombies is far worse than Vanguard. Now, we'll get into Vanguard shortly, but for right now, let's talk about what I don't like about AW. Ironically, for a game mode called Exo Zombies, the biggest failing of not just the Zombies mode, but the entire game is the Exo suit. Advanced Warfare's take on not just advanced movement, but movement in general is probably the worst I've seen in any game I've ever played. The standard for advanced movement at the time and still to this day is Titanfall. And where Titanfall's jetpacks and wall running make for an incredibly smooth, flowing, and natural extension of the mechanics games like Halo and Call of Duty pioneered for console shooters, Advanced Warfare basically just added a button to violently throw the player into a chosen direction and called it a day at that. The developers also decided to give many of the zombies these same exosuits, which greatly increased the speed of the game. Unfortunately, that speed is entirely unpredictable predictable since one second a zombie will be running at you normally and the next the zombie will have jumped 20 feet and already be attacking you. And there's no time to predict or react to this. It's like every zombie has the range of the tigers from 9 and it's exactly as broken as that sounds. If you want to have a casual, low stress game of zombies, this mode simply will not work for you. On top of that, the maps more often than not don't accommodate the new movement abilities very well. Outbreak and Ascent are split between narrow hallways and medium sized rooms. Infection has more open areas, but also forces the players into the dark cramped sewers as the rounds progress. Carrier is the only map that even makes an attempt to open things up, and even then it's far from flawless. And speaking of the maps, they're all locked behind paid DLC. Advanced Warfare does not launch with even one zombies map, but instead a heavily watered down version of Modern Warfare 3's survival mode for the base game. And I haven't even talked about the weak weapon sandbox, terrible pack punch system, the endless assault of special enemies and EMZs, the entirely nonsensical easter eggs and uninteresting storyline. Regardless of what you want out of a zombies game, I have a hard time finding any reason of any kind to recommend Exo Zombies to anyone. And speaking of games that I have a hard time recommending to anyone, let's circle back to the game at our number 9 spot. Vanguard Zombies. Now I understand why having Vanguard ranked as anything other than the worst in the franchise is shocking, but the game mode does do a few things that just squeak it above Exos for me. For starters, all of the Zombies content is included in the base game. When you purchase a new copy of Call of Duty Vanguard, you don't have to then fork over another 50 or 60 bucks for the privilege of playing its underwhelming Zombies mode. That's a big deal and will become an even bigger deal when the game eventually goes on sale in the future. Vanguard also has a number of improvements since its abysmal launch. We have two round based maps and a fully realized attempt at what Durong Fong tried to do. Features that should have been in the game like the ray gun, pack punch camos, and a pause feature for solo are in the game now. While it's not good that Vanguard didn't launch with these features, may I remind you that Advanced Warfare also launched without a pause button. Why is it always Sledgehammer? Vanguard also offers a far better casual experience due to the lack of exosuits, as well as a mastery camo and tons of weapon attachments for you to grind for and try out, and you can use all of that stuff you grind for in the multiplayer, which adds some additional value. Vanguard also has the luxury of modern graphics, though visibility is oftentimes a bit of an issue. A key distinction for a lot of people comparing Vanguard and Exos is that Exos has four round based maps, whereas Vanguard only has two, and the two objectives objective base maps that few in the community actually like. And while Advanced Warfare has the advantage in terms of quantity, I would rather play Shinonuma or the Archon over any Exo Zombies map. The only thing that keeps Vanguard from being head and shoulders above Exo 
zombies is that as far as I'm aware, Vanguard doesn't have any way for you to play the mode offline, at least on console. So you can end up having connection problems even when playing solo. While I can't recommend Exo Zombies to anyone, Vanguard is at least fine if you want to AFK slay and don't mind the occasional connection issues when playing solo. It's not good for anything else, but at least you could turn your brain off and shoot things. Now, while I have the next game on our list, just a spot above Advanced Warfare and Vanguard, I do want to mention that there is a significant step up between the number 9 and 8 spots. If I could have another 4 or 5 spaces between Vanguard and this next game, I would. But coming in at the number 8 spot, we have Call of Duty World War II Zombies. Rounding out all of the zombies mode in Sledgehammer Call of Duty games, World War II is by far the best, but that's a low bar given that this game mode was only barely able to cross that line. Unlike Exos and Vanguard, there's actually a lot Call of Duty World War II Zombies does right. The debut map for this game, the Final Reich, was actually a really strong introduction for the game and it has become one of my favorite maps in the franchise. It's a map that does almost everything right with very few laws. Turning on the power and accessing Pack-a-Punch is simple to figure out for yourself, and if you need any help crafting the Wonder Weapon or doing the Easter Egg, the newly added notebook will make it easier for you without having to look up a guide. Speaking of the Wonder Weapons, the Tesla Gun is a relatively simple to craft and easy to upgrade Wonder Weapon, though it's functionally identical to a Wonder Waff, and the Easter Egg was split into a casual and hardcore quest, which helps new players get introduced to the idea of Easter Eggs without sacrificing the experience of those already engrossed in that side of the game. Combine all of that with a strong layout, balanced special enemies, a satisfying narrative quality, and sense of discovery draped over the entire map, and you have a really strong debut map. And that doesn't even take into account all of the out-of-game progression World War II has, from unlocking Raven tokens and upgrading your class, to unlocking the survival map Grosten House after completing one of the two quest lines in the Final Reich, all of the custom characters you can earn by completing hidden challenges, and more. World War II has a lot of content for dedicated fans to earn, but it works just as well for anyone looking to jump into a match and shoot some zombies. Though it would have been nice if the Grosten House survival map wasn't locked behind the Easter egg and was just available to everyone. Look, I know they were trying to increase the appeal of Easter eggs, but locking an entire map behind an Easter egg? That really didn't work. The main issue I have with World War II and why it's specifically here at number 8 on the list is map quality. Because while the Final Reich is a solid map, the DLC maps were all pretty underwhelming. The Darkest Shore felt small, added fog, and one of the least balanced bosses in the entire franchise, which didn't work for a lot of people. The Shadowed Throne shot itself in the foot by having one of the worst Pack-a-Punch quests in the franchise. The Tortured Path was a failed attempt at objective-based gameplay for zombies, with its only saving grace being the survival maps that came as part of the DLC. And while the Frozen Dawn isn't terrible, it's not an experience worth going out of your way to play. For as good as the Final Reich is, is it's hard to recommend a game with only one strong map above the rest of the games left in the franchise. Call of Duty World War II rounds out all of these sledgehammer titles for this list, and the next game is going to round out another trilogy, this time the trilogy of all of the games set in World War II. Coming in at the number 7 spot, we have the game where it all started, Call of Duty World at War. This is the game where it all started for zombies in Call of Duty and where I started with the game mode. I still love the game all these years later, but unfortunately, there's not a whole lot to say about this one. The mode wasn't even initially planned out for World at War, the developers made it in their spare time, thought it was fun, and somehow managed to get it in the game anyway. The developers are still figuring out what they want this side mode to be while maps are being released, and it definitely shows. World at War is a glitchy game as a whole, and the zombies mode has a bulk of these glitches. By modern standards, there's not a whole lot of content in these maps. Only one map has Pack-a-Punch, one doesn't even have perks, and there's no easter eggs of any kind apart from the incredibly brief fly trap. In the map quality in World at War was great for the time, but by modern standards, they're all incredibly simple. If you grew up in the era of Black Ops 3 and 4, these maps won't hold your attention for very long at all. And when you consider that these maps were all remade once in Black Ops and then again in Black Ops 3, and then again in a few other games here and there, it's hard to say that you need to go back to World at War at all. The only draw for this game is the custom zombie scene, which was going strong for over nearly a whole 
whole decade before official mod support finally rolled around for Black Ops 3 Zombies. World at War is a complete package and still worth playing today for the campaign alone, and while the online components are either unpopulated at best or infested with hackers at worst, the multiplayer and zombies are still fun if you can get a custom game going. But if you don't already have the game and its DLC and aren't interested in checking out custom maps from over a decade ago on PC, it's probably best if you spend that money to explore a different part of the game's history. Speaking of the game's history, the next game on our list is probably the most divisive game in the history of the franchise. At the number 6 spot, we have Black Ops 4. This game is what I would call a mixed bag. As far as map quality goes, it has a couple of great maps like 9, Classified, and Agent Evil, and it also has some of the worst maps in the franchise like Dead of the Night and Alpha Omega. A lot of people would throw Voyage of Despair and Blood of the Dead into the worst category as well. For me, they're just kind of underwhelming. And unfortunately, because of the way this game is monetized, it's either all or nothing. Black Ops 4 replaced the Season Pass with the Black Ops Pass, which essentially meant you can no longer buy individual pieces of DLC anymore. So if you wanted just the first DLC map, you also had to buy the other three. As you can imagine, this change went over poorly. But the division doesn't stop there. Black Ops 4 attempted to fix a lot of problems inherent with the prior games, and in doing so caused a lot more problems without even really fixing what was initially wrong. For example, one of the problems the developers wanted to fix were crutch perks. They were tired of people getting jug, quick revive, speed cool, and double tap in every single game, which was a real issue. However, to fix that, they made quick revive part of a standard solo game, which was a good change, but also removed jug from the game entirely and thereby made the player super weak, they removed speed cola and made the player reload slow at all times, and baked double tap into pack a punch and removed all incentive to switch out weapons in the mid to late game. They also forced you to pick a set of 4 perks before the match started with create a class, which removed any chance of improvisation, introduced a new series of crush perks to replace the 4 they got rid of, and locked some perks behind your rank, which disincentivized prestiging entirely. That create a class also allowed players to spawn into their match with elixirs, which gave the player a lot of overpowered abilities, grenades that basically do infinite damage, and a specialist weapon, and it destroyed the balance of the early game. Black Ops 4 has highlights that are worth seeking out, but the game puts so many walls between them and the player to the point where I can't recommend this game to anyone other than the hardest of the hardcore. You have to be willing to look up and memorize the guides, spend a lot of money on the base game and its DLC, spend a lot of time learning the maps themselves, the new mechanics of the game, and grinding to either max rank without prestiging and staying there, or grinding all the way to prestige master so the level restriction doesn't get in the way of the sandbox. If you put the work in, Black Ops 4 can be a good game, and at times even a great game, but it would have been a lot better had none of these changes been made. Moving into the top half of our list, we have a game that I expect to get a little flack for not putting higher. At the number 5 spot, we have the original Black Ops. After World Out War started the Zombies mode, Black Ops solidified what the mode would be going forward. This is where we got our first real easter egg, is, is where high rounds became popular after training was adopted as a primary strategy. We even got our first real through line for the story in this game. The formula that the series built off of for the next two games really started with the original Black Ops. The only real complaints I have for the game is the weapon sandbox. It's a little underpowered. Most of the weapons don't do enough damage to be useful after round 20 or 25, and even the best weapons don't have the ammo capacity to get you through several rounds. You really have to lean on the wonder weapons and traps to get through some of the late game, which isn't a bad thing per se, but not the playstyle I favor, much less want forced upon me. And as far as map quality goes, I'm personally a little underwhelmed. A lot of these maps are extremely popular, but while the two launch maps are very strong, the DLC, it could be a little hit or miss for me. Up next at the number 4 spot, we have a new favorite of mine with Infinite Warfare Zombies. This is a mode that is first and foremost built off of style and simplicity. The maps generally feel like a blend between the simplicity of the original Black Ops, but also have the depth of a Black Ops 3 map without feeling quite so intense. On top of that, the style and charisma that oozes out of every pore of this game is simply unmatched in not just Call of Duty, but the game industry as a whole. There are very few games that can do what IW Zombies does in this regard. On top of the presentation of its maps, the gameplay itself is solid. The game has 4 maps that range from great to near perfect, 
and one disaster with the last map, we won't talk about that. They work well for casual games, serious attempts at easter eggs, high rounds, speedruns, and just about every other playstyle you can imagine, and the game's super easter egg is far and away the best reward for easter egg players in the entire franchise. The only real complaint I have with the game is that, not unlike the original Black Ops, the weapon sandbox is a little underpowered, and a lot of maps have strange requirements to get to pack a punch. While I have the muscle memory to go prone next to every perk machine thanks to World at War, I don't think most players would think to look underneath this game's juggernaut equivalent to pick up a coin that's needed for Pack-a-Punch on Shaolin Shuffle, but while these quests can be completely arbitrary at times, once you know the requirements, it's pretty simple to execute. Moving into the top three, we have Black Ops Cold War. Whenever anyone talks about Cold War zombies, the first thing that comes to mind is just how solid the game's foundation is, which is especially relieving after the failed science experiment that was Black Ops 4. Not unlike Black Ops 4, Cold War does attempt to fix a lot of the issues present in the game's original formula, but unlike Black Ops 4, it both actually fixes those issues and does it without throwing away everything from that original formula. For example, in Cold War, rather than remaking the perk system into an ultra-restrictive nightmare, they just remove the perk limit altogether. Sure, you still have perks that are better than others, but you're not restricted in your choice whatsoever. Buildables were also more or less removed entirely, with the shield being replaced with a new armor system. High rounds were restructured in a way that makes each round quick and based on gun skill movement and strategy instead of long slogs based on resource management and manipulating drop cycles. Easter eggs were streamlined and simplified, which made hardcore Easter egg fans upset but made them worth playing for players like myself. And the developers built on that solid foundation with one of the best weapon sandboxes in the entire franchise, a mastery camo to grind for for the ultra dedicated, and a super Easter egg that isn't quite as good as Infinite Warfare's but still rewarding in its own way. For all the game does right, it does still have some issues. While I love the changes made to high rounds, low grade salvage becomes impossible to come by the closer you get to round 100, which makes it more valuable than it should be. This is actually the rare thing Vanguard improved on. That game only has one salvage currency, which I think is a lot better for high rounds. While I love the simplified easter eggs as someone who's never engaged with that side of the game previously, the people who did love the complex easter eggs found this part of the game rather underwhelming. Plus, the way the easter eggs are presented didn't allow players to discover them for themselves. There's no mystery or problem solving involved, as each quest basically unraveled itself for you. The pace of the updates also left a lot to be desired. The game mode was more or less untouched from launch through the holidays, barring a failed limited time game mode. Then we got both DLC 1 and 2 in the same month, only for DLC 3 to release what felt like an entire half year afterward. It was definitely annoying at times, but obviously not an issue now. The big problem most people have with Cold War is the complete lack of personality throughout the entire mode. Where a game like Infinite Warfare has character and style you can see from miles away, Cold War boils it down to military jargon for character dialogue and explicitly telling the player what to do and when. Pretty much all of the maps play identically, which is fine considering the foundation is really strong, but apart from the visuals they can all start to blend together. Considering the context of the game's development and post-launch support is not a mystery why this might have happened, but it doesn't really help the final product. Speaking of said final product, not unlike Vanguard, all the DLC maps for Cold War are completely free, which definitely makes this game more appealing than it otherwise would be. As far as bang for your buck goes, Cold War really only has one other contender. But we're gonna skip over that contender to talk about the game at our number two spot, which, appropriately enough, is Black Ops 2. I would describe Black Ops 2 zombies as perfectly imperfect. In a way, it's a mixed bag like Black Ops 4, but its bright spots are so much brighter and the lowlights are fewer and further between. Truthfully for myself, the only lowlight as far as the mainline map go is Transit, which unfortunately is the launch map. However, if you're willing to get the season pass along with the base game, you'll have a number of the best zombies maps of all time, and they range the gamut from simple and accessible to complex and deep. Mob of the Dead, Buried, and Origins alone can keep you coming back for years, and while Die Rise and Nuketown zombies are niche experiences that are more often than not lambasted by parts of this community, I happen to love both of them for what they are. Each one of these maps play completely differently from each other, but they all somehow somehow still feel like Black Ops 2 maps, and they can all cater to casual players, high rounds, easter egg and storyline fans, and speedrunners in at least some way. Black Ops 2 also raised the bar with a lot of experiments, so this was the first time we saw any form of stat tracking or ranking within a zombies mode. And while it's simple at best and completely 
archaic and obscure at worst, is better than not having anything. It's the first time that a zombies mode has had a theater mode, since for some reason Black Ops only had theater for multiplayer. It's the first time we see a real emphasis on buildables, both for craftable items as well as wonder weapons, as well as things like permapurse, the bank, double pack-a-punch, and equipable attachments for certain weapons. There's even entirely different side game modes like Turned and Grief, as well as a heavily limited but appreciated custom games menu. While not all of these ideas ended up benefiting the game and sticking around, a lot of these ideas either continued into future games or were modified into entirely new features. Some of them have even sat on a shelf for a decade while the community begged on their hands and knees for them to return. How do we still not have grief in 2023? Black Ops 2 is able to do a lot well, but there are a few notable flaws. As we already talked about, this game relies heavily on its DLC content. If you want the best experience from this game, you have to buy the DLC. Transit just isn't a good map, and while there are a few sections of this map that were cut out and turned into their own mini survival maps, there just isn't enough there to keep you busy for long. On top of that, with how different each of the DLC maps are, you really have to do your research to get something you want. If you're a really casual Zombies player who wants to play Black Ops 2, Buried is going to be an absolute slam dunk choice for you, but Mob of the Dead might be tedious and infuriating. On the flip side, Origins gives you a ton of stuff you can do, which is great for players who really want to sink their teeth into a map and learn it over the course of an entire month, whereas a skilled player could master a map like Die Rise in just a couple days. I can't knock the game for variety, just know that these maps aren't one size fits all. The only other major flaw in this game is that it can definitely be a little glitchy at times. There aren't many game breaking bugs left like there are back in World at War, but sometimes the mechanics might screw you over in a way that feels unfair. Zombies attack you after your nuke is picked up, monkey bombs disappearing into the aether after touching the floor weirdly, and explosive rounds after guns like the Mustang and Sally and Rank and Mark II detonating in midair without hitting anything are all things that come to mind. These glitches can be few and far between, but Murphy's Law will cause them to strike at the worst possible time, so just be aware, they exist. And at the number one spot, as just about anyone could have predicted, we have Black Ops 3. There really isn't another game that I would even consider for the top spot here. With Black Ops 3, we have the best lineup of original maps, in my opinion. You have Zombies and Chronicles adding most of the best maps from the prior three games and giving Black Ops 3 the highest number of maps in the franchise to date. And by the way, when you get Black Ops 3 digitally nowadays, it comes with Zombie Chronicles nine times out of 10. So the on-disc content, for lack of a better word, is excellent. And if that somehow isn't enough content for you, PC players have the longest luxury of developer supported custom maps and mods. The original maps are by and large a perfect blend of simplicity and complexity, and the maps included in Zombie Chronicles range from bare bones Nocturne and Toten to a slightly more complicated ascension to even something extremely complicated like Origins. Regardless of your skill level or how much time you're willing to spend learning each map, there's something here for you to enjoy. On top of the largest selection of quality maps, Black Ops 3 also has one of the best weapon sandboxes, great enemy design, a revamped approach to movement with sliding, and the best version of high rounds and easter eggs for fans of the classic zombies formula the original Black Ops pioneered. The only complaint I have with Black Ops 3 is that the perk variety is almost non-existent for me personally. Every match for me boils down to quick revive, jug, widow's wine, and stamina. up. The one time I deviate from this is if I'm doing something very specific that requires a specific perk, or I'm playing a map like Horizon Drac or Garot Krovi where Widow's Wine is in the Wonder Fizz and really hard to get. For others, this might be different, but that was certainly my experience over the past almost an entire decade. Jesus Christ has almost been an entire decade. The other complaint is that this was the first game in the series to introduce game-changing microtransactions with gobble gums. I haven't mentioned it in the video so far, but Infinite Warfare, World War II, and Black Ops 4 also had a variation of these, but Black Ops 3's gobble gums are the most noteworthy and game-changing of the bunch in my experience. Beyond just disliking microtransactions in my games, these can ruin online co-op. As a solo player, I have the luxury of avoiding them in my games, and if you're playing with a group of friends you can all just agree to not use them, but online co-op can easily devolve into one player being fully set up on round one and not only start taking all of the kills for themselves but making it possible for you to set up. It also has the unintended side effect of creating a ton of different categories and qualifiers for speedruns, high rounds, and easter eggs, etc. There are ways you can avoid these issues of course. Perk variety is only something I notice for myself most of the time and you can force yourself to try new things every once in a while. As for the gobble gun, 
sometimes I just play solo matches and I always avoid using the monetized versions. The standard gums are really strong anyway, so unless you need the extreme advantage, there's not a real need or desire for them. The same works for games with friends. If you're willing to back out of matches where a player is abusing the paid gums, then you'll be all set. Given how most Call of Duties become victim to hackers a few years after they release, I'm not sure it's even worth trying to play online co-op matches in this game anyway. Plus, the upsides of Black Ops 3 make up for these issues several times over. And there you have it, that's my ranking of every single Call of Duty Zombies game from worst to best. Let me know what you think of my list in the comments below and leave your own ranking down there as well. Thanks for watching, like the video if you made it this far, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.